You've probably heard the stereotype. Black people. Black people. Black people. Black people just can't swim. For generations, this has been an all too familiar tale within the black community. But here's something you may not know. Black children are drowning at three times the rate of white children. And years of racial segregation in America's pools may be to blame. In the United States, 64% of black children can't swim. My son, Genesis Holmes, was only 13 years old. He wanted to swim with his friends. In May 2014, police reported to a scene near a local high school in the small town of Hollywood, South Carolina. An unidentified teen was found floating in a pond off Highway 162. Dive and rescue teams scoured the area and recovered the body of Genesis Holmes. Genesis didn't make it back out because Genesis didn't know how to swim. All our life, most of us, honestly, we was told to stay from the water. It's like a family tradition that they had from generation to the next generation. So I taught my children to stay away from water. Genesis had so much plans. He had great plans for his life. Genesis's death is reflective of a darker trend of accidental drownings across the country. In the U.S., more than 10 people die from drowning each day. One in five of those deaths are children between the ages of 1 and 14. And most of those deaths are disproportionately Black. So why is this happening? And why are Black children drowning at such high rates? We tapped University of Montana history professor Jeff Wiltsey to talk about racism and the social history that shaped America's first public pools. The very first public pools were located exclusively in large northeastern cities, Philadelphia, Boston, New York. They were all in poor neighborhoods, what we call urban slums. For the poor children of New York, a million dollar swimming pool, a luxury summer resort for the kids of the sweltering tenements and slums on east side. Where poor and working class immigrants, native born African Americans lived, and, and that's the population that they were intended to serve. Sort of dirty working class boys and young men would plunge into the pool and then clean themselves in the water of the pool. It was essentially served as a large bathtub. That's right. The first public pools were not only racially inclusive, but they served as bathhouses for the poor who often swam nude. For this reason, public pools originally prohibited men and women from swimming together. But after World War I, that all changed. After the war, Americans were earning more and working less. To give you a sense, the average work week went from 59 hours before the war to 51 hours after the war. This gave Americans a lot more time to enjoy leisure activities like swimming and eventually opened the door for new mixed gender pools. And it's the point at which a city gender integrates, allows males and females to use the same pool at the same time that cities and white swimmers impose racial segregation. In a nutshell, the basic reason was, you know, white public officials and white swimmers would not allow black men to interact with white women at such an intimate public space. Racial discrimination became normalized and institutionalized across the country. From the North to the South, white-only pools became hallmarks for racial exclusion, and they would stay that way until the 60s. Southern cities used Jim Crow laws to enforce segregation in pools and other public spaces, while Northern cities used intimidation and violence to keep blacks out. All the while, local chapters of the NAACP worked to file lawsuits against neighborhood pools and beaches that denied blacks access. Pools went from being places for leisure to racial battlegrounds. And it would take two protests in Florida to change that. What are you prepared to do now, Dr. King? Well, we will uh, stand here and protest what we feel is a blatant injustice. On June 11, 1964, Police arrested Dr. Martin Luther King and more than a dozen religious leaders after they staged a protest against racial segregation at the Monson Motor Lodge in St. Augustine, Florida. His arrest inspired others to act. 
Less than a week later, 16 rabbis joined a group of black and white protesters at the same hotel. As the rabbis prayed on the property, protesters jumped into a white-only pool to stage a swim in. What happened next sent shockwaves across the country. That's the Motor Lodge hotel owner, James Brooke, pouring acid into the pool to get protesters out. Media reports of the story sparked enough outrage to gain the attention of then-President Lyndon B. Johnson. Some activists even say it influenced Johnson to sign the Civil Rights Act less than a month later. All men are entitled to the blessings of liberty, yet millions are being deprived of those blessings, not because of their own failures, but because of the color of their skin. The bill outlawed segregation based on race, color, religion, or sex, a notion that until that point was common practice throughout most of the country. And while several places across the U.S. had already begun desegregating public spaces, by the time the Civil Rights Act was passed, it was too late. After World War II, white Americans left cities for the suburbs in pursuit of the highly commercialized American dream. You know the whole car, white picket fence, home in the suburbs. Now you might be thinking, what does white flight have to do with black people swimming? Well, the answer is a lot. Once white Americans left for the suburbs, cities throughout the country stopped investing in the upkeep of their public pools. So when blacks and other minorities finally regained access after the Civil Rights Act, most of them had already closed. Tens of thousands of private club pools developed in suburban communities. And what that enables suburban communities to do, members to do, is to control who has access to those pools and who they determined would not have access to those pools and the swim lessons that occurred at those pools. Today, gentrification is the driving force behind modern day pool segregation. So in other words, it isn't so much your race that determines your likelihood of being able to swim, but your class. For example, affluent suburban communities are far more likely to have access to pools than their city counterparts. Look at the numbers and you can see why. There are more than 10 million residential pools compared to the 300,000 public pools across the country. On top of that, public pools are disappearing. Since 2009, more than 1,800 public pools have closed across the country. Some rural towns like Hollywood, South Carolina, where Genesis Homes lived, never even opened one. Genesis cried out for help because he didn't know how to swim. If me and my husband had gave him swim lesson, Genesis would have made it out. After Genesis' death, Jennifer Holmes couldn't stop thinking about the what ifs. What if she had learned how to swim? What if Genesis had swim lessons? That's when she came up with an idea. Being that I lost our baby, I had to do something to where that I could let others know how important water safety is, that what we were taught is not good for us. And why is this, it's important to learn how to swim, to help reduce drowning out in the rural area. And she didn't stop there. Holmes became a lifeguard and raised more than $15,000 for the Genesis Project to bring swimming lessons to black children in her small town. It wouldn't take long before the rest of the community noticed. After hearing about Genesis, the Charleston County Parks Foundation gave Holmes $3 million towards opening the town's first public pool, the Genesis Pool. We should rejoice this day that many lives will learn how to swim. We honor Genesis Holmes, and we honor all that went this tragic way. We don't care where you're from. You are welcome to learn about water safety. Thank you. When Genesis was about five, six year old, he told me about amazing vision that he had, that he was sitting in a palm of a man hand and it was huge. Mom, I'm gonna do big things. 
you know? <laughs> it's like, Genesis, come on, you're five, six years old, big things. He said, yes, mom, you should have saw his hands. His hand was so amazing. I was sitting in the clouds. And when they told me that Genesis and his friends were swimming, and Genesis did me up. My life changed, our life changed. And all I can remember is that Genesis said, Mom, I'm going to help many people. And so many people is going to die.